You're listening to This Week in E-Commerce, the Ecom Nation podcast. Dive into the top online retail headlines with your hosts, Paul Waddy and Mal Chia. Let's load up the cart. This Week in E-Commerce, episode 33. I am Mal Chia, flying solo this week with Paul Waddy in parts unknown. I'm recording today from yet another location. This time I'm filming from Work It Spaces, which in Alexandria, in Sydney, uh, which is where the new Ecom Nation offices are. So you might notice that the audio sounds a little bit different. Uh, if this works out quite well, I'll probably be trying to record from here more often, just getting used to all the settings on this very, very fancy road uh, podcaster um, kit, which I've got here, which is uh, which is pretty cool. Although I'm not really too familiar with this, as I'm kind of used to just filming on the road with uh, with whatever I've got there. But anyway, we will keep going on, and we will keep trying to improve and innovate, as we always say that you should do as well in your business. All right, so we are into April now. This year is just flying by, and we are also past daylight savings, so we are now back to standard time. So hopefully uh, that'll be nice to be able to try to get things aligned again with the uh, with the rest of the country. Um, but obviously, you know, some changes abound, particularly if you are dealing with suppliers or partners in the United States, Europe, or anywhere like that, uh, where your time differences are probably out by quite a lot. I know that I've had to get some early nights in this, early mornings in this week, uh, adjusting to some US calls. But never mind, we will continue because it has been yet another very, very busy week in the retail sector. And every week it seemed that things you know, just keep building and building and building um, with lots of things going on. Um, as we've talked about many, many times before, um, there is Retail Fest, which is going to be on next week. So very excited for that. Ecom Nation will have a booth there, so please come along and say hi to us. We would love to see you and have a chat. And we are going to be giving away some free strategy sessions with the Ecom Nation team. So if you are around, please come and say hi, sign up, and we will be gifting a few of those over the, uh, over the few days there. Um, Paul, myself, and Arabella will be hosting different workshops on day one, so three different competing workshops. And on day two and three, we'll have a few different sessions on different stages as well. So really looking forward to catching up with the retail team there. And obviously with all the number of events going on around there, plenty of time for everyone to network, get to know each other, uh, and hopefully learn a thing or two as well. But before that, we're going to be talking a little bit about some not so recent news anymore, but some reports from the NRA, so the National Retail Association, which uh, and also the ABS as well, so the Australian Bureau of Statistics, which is all about Taylor Swift, uh, who's someone who we haven't really talked about too much on the show, um, but for someone who I think means quite a lot to a lot of people, whether you're talking about here or globally, Taylor Swift just brings with her such an amazing following and such an amazing fan base. Now, I'm not a huge fan of her music. I don't really know too much of her music, to be, to be quite honest. Um, but my wife does, and so do a lot of people um, who I'm friends with, and also a lot of the team as well. Um, in the same way that Beyonce released a country album, and I didn't even know it was around. Um, but I did hear it the other day, and it was, it was okay. It wasn't really my cup of tea, and I do like country music, but I wasn't a huge fan of hers. But anyway, I digress. Uh, back to Taylor Swift. So back to Taylor Swift. Earlier this year, in February, she sold out seven concerts in Sydney and Melbourne. So this was uh, amounted to over 600,000 people, 600,000 Swifties who attended these events. Now, in the US, the US claimed uh, that Taylor Swift added somewhere in the region of $10 billion of retail sales uh, just from people buying tickets, buying merchandise, and also just putting money back into the economy in each one of the, the, the tours which she did. The era's tours throughout Australia, I'm still in America, but in Australia, um, they are saying that 0.1% uh, of the growth uh, in in um, of sales uh, was due to Taylor Swift. So if you look at the numbers there, from um, retail spending was up year on year in February from 30 uh, up to 35.8 billion dollars, um, which is up 1.6%. Now, when you look at that, let me just quickly do the math here, and I should have crunched these numbers before. Uh, that when you look at that amount, that amount is somewhere in the region of about you know, 10, uh, 35 to $50 million, which was spent on Taylor Swift uh, over that period, which is, which is quite a significant amount um, when, you look at, when you look at it, that how some, one person can have such a positive impact on retail spending. 
with more people just feeling more positive about the, the economy, uh, looking past um, you know, some of the economic uncertainty which we're currently facing uh, and the volatility, I guess, and being comfortable to go out and spend over that period. So really positive to see the impact which he's having of, of, of just encouraging more people to go out and spend more money. And throughout that period as well, we did see that flow down to increases in sales and department stores, as well as, like I mentioned before, the hospitality sector saw a 2.9% increase. Uh, an increase in um in house in food sales as well over that period. So that's really fantastic. However, at the same time though, as Rob Godwin, a good friend at the NRA, um, has been saying for a while, we can't rely on these, you know, once in a lifetime moments to be able to happen, um, to be able to drive the economy. We still need to figure out a way to to continue to grow profitably and sustainably. So I think that while we've have seen that temporary blip in February, that we are still seeing a bit of a challenging time you know, at the moment. So with Australians in particular looking to cut back on discretionary spend, and that really is a spend which has been cutting back on, because as we talked about previously as well, the sales of common household goods, food sales, supermarkets, et cetera, is still very, very strong. Like still people do need to spend money there, and they are spending more there. Most likely, and it is because the prices have also been going up as well, which we're going to talk about a little bit later with the recent grocery code of conduct which just put in place. So while we're seeing more food spending um, you know, as, uh, uh, and people spending more on that as prices go up, overall spending, we are expecting to go down through March and definitely in April as well. And that can only be seen with, with some of the things we've been seeing in the market lately, particularly around the heavy levels of discounting, which did have to happen through the Easter sale with a number of retailers only just recently ending their, their Easter sales, but also through that period going much deeper with discounts. And even brands who have historically not had to discount too much are just, you can tell, just discounting more and more and more and going deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's a problem which we're, which we're going to be seeing more, which leads to the second story we can talk about today, which is Marquee Brands. Marquee Brands, uh, Marquee Retail Group, which owns Colette and also last year purchased a daily edit to brought them out of administration, um, also recently announced that they are going into voluntary administration. Now, they are chaired by Bernie Brooks, formerly of Maya, uh, and Bernie in the interviews did not sound particularly bullish on where the market was sitting and was expecting to see more and more of these administrations happening, and which is something which we've already been seeing and something we've been talking about quite a lot with some of the changes that the decrease in consumer spending, it means that a lot of these brands who are less resilient are continuing to, are going to be experiencing their fair trouble, similar to Tiger Lily, which we talked about a few episodes ago, and the challenges they've been facing. And obviously, they've been, they're currently in volunteer administration as well. And in the case of marquee brands, what happened with their, with their business is that they already had to restructure a lot of their debts, um, particularly with, with the ATO and probably with, with, other, uh, with other debtors as well, which meant that as demand changed, rising interest rates, rising inflation rates, that they're unable to service their debt anymore, which means that they've had to go back to, um, which means that they've had to go back into administration effectively to avoid um, defaulting on their, on, on their obligations. So this is a challenge which a lot of businesses are facing. And when I look at this, it's, it, it does compound the issue. And some, the word which, which Paul and I have been using quite a lot is a death spiral. And that if you don't, if you're not careful, this can very much be a death spiral for your business. Because by not focusing and not being able to focus on your underlying profitability means that you are putting your overall business at risk because you end up robbing Peter to pay Paul, essentially. In this case, I don't mean Paul Waddy. I mean that you end up having to discount, which affects your bottom line, which means you have less money to reinvest, particularly if you're doing things like going on sale and then also spending heavily on ads, which is something which we see very, very often, that retailers are not changing the amount they spend on ads to hit their revenue targets. So while you may be hitting a million dollar sales month, which may be an all-time high, you're probably doing it at the expense of margin. And you're doing it on both ways because not only are you reducing your margin by going on discount, you're also still spending the same amount of ads, which means at the end of the day, you probably have the same, if not less money left over, which means less money to then reinvest back into the business. And this could be in things like ordering new stock, hiring new staff, just keeping the wheels turning. And as we can see with everything else, 
prices are going up across the board. Shipping and logistics is going up. Freight is going up. If anyone's been looking at their courier bills lately, you can also see they've probably been going up as well. And for good reason, because the cost of business is generally going up. So you need to be smarter about how you are running your business. What are you doing to make sure that you aren't letting your costs spiral out of control? Because like we said, it is going to be a death spiral if you don't have those things under control. Not having those numbers well managed and not really understanding what they are means that your business is eventually going to get into a point where you're not going to be able to reinvest in anymore and you're going to have less free cash flow. And that's really ultimately it. As the saying goes, cash is king. So you often need to look at, well, you always need to look at what is the free cash flow in your business, which is a cash which is actually available for you to spend, which isn't committed to other things. And if your free cash flow keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, that means you've got less to invest. Less to invest in new stock, advertising, new marketing initiatives, anything which we've said before. So really making sure that you do keep a really close eye on that means that hopefully more businesses might be able to avoid the situation they're finding themselves in. But unfortunately, what's been happening is that through COVID, when everyone performed very, very well, there was overall an overinvestment into inventory. And a lot of brands are still paying that price, are still paying, the, paying for the sins which they made off the back of successful like, um, COVID. When COVID was going well, they saw the stock fly off the shelves and they got desperate and they just ordered more. They wanted to capitalize. They wanted to capitalize on where things were at the moment and they decided to just go hard and order as much as they thought they could sell. And the numbers generally supported that without realizing that it was a bubble and it was going to burst. And when it did eventually burst, we are left holding the bag with a lot more stock than we can realistically sell. And in numerous conversations with retailers, that is something which I see time and time again, where they're still holding on to a lot of old dead stock, and they're not thinking about how do they move that. And that in a desperate race to survive, they discount everything without focusing on where the real problem actually lies in the business. And more often than not, that real problem lies in their aged inventory. The inventory they can no longer sell or no one wants to buy, so they discount. And then they discount the wrong things rather than focusing on clearing out that stock and creating more free cash flow. Now, by focusing on that, it may mean that your business will shrink. Your sales may go down. But that's not a bad thing because it means you're right sizing your business. It means that you're putting your business back in a healthier position so that you can then, once everything is settled, focus on growing again. But it's that willingness to want to make that change to want to actually accept the fact that, hey, we can't be this size anymore. We actually need to right size for where we should be at rather than trying to be something which we realistically can no longer be. It's a big challenge a lot of retailers face and something which I hope that a lot of people here listening are going to be thinking about these so that we can continue to have a healthy, thriving retail scene in Australia. All right, and moving on to our final story for today, we're going to be talking about the recent grocery code of conduct. So the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, recently uh, supported, expressed support for the independent review of the grocery code of conduct, which proposes a mandatory code which will result in multi-million dollar penalties for supermarkets and suppliers who engage in anti-competitive prices practices. Now, this has been a long time coming. As we talked about earlier, the prices of everything is going up, but in particular, groceries. Even the other day, I was looking in my pantry, and I'm one of those people who, when they shop, I will buy, I'll, when I see that it's, when something's running out in the fridge, I'll instantly go out to the shop and buy another one. Problem is that I often don't look first in the pantry to make sure I don't have another one of those sitting there already. So in my case, I went to the pantry, and I was running out of Dijon mustard, and I instinctively went to the shop bought it next time I was there. And when I was putting it back in the pantry, I noticed that I had two other bottles of Dijon mustard there, all purchased over the last 12 to 18 months. But the thing which struck me was the price tag on each one of those. That the price of the same bottle of Dijon mustard had gone from $5.95 to $7.95 and $9.95. So in one year, in about 18 months or so, the price had almost doubled. 
that almost increased 100% over that time, which is extraordinary inflation. And you're seeing this more and more. And a lot of people are talking about this in terms of like shrinkflation, where you pay the same price, but you get less. But generally, you're just seeing overall the prices of things just as creep up and up and up. So while we're spending more at the grocery, we're getting the same amount. We're not actually getting more in return. And this is what this code looks to address by actually introducing a, a method to be able to police this, to make sure that the, 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 the price increases, which we're seeing, are actually in line with CPI. One thing which is very common, and we've seen this over time and time again, is the fact that the main supermarkets, which are Woolworths and Coles, essentially operate as a duopoly. Because they control such a large portion of the market, they can, set, they can dictate the terms. They can dictate the terms for their suppliers, but also dictate the terms for customers as well. And effectively, almost without saying it, collude on pricing by, man, by saying that this is how much bread needs to be or milk needs to be. And therefore, the rest of the market needs to follow suit. And it becomes a race to the bottom, which means they can effectively force manufacturers to sell them for less because they need the volume there. While the, same, while, while the only person who really benefits from all of this are Woolies and Coles. So what they want to do is to introduce the code of conduct, which means that when they do price things or increase the prices, it is done fairly, and there will be severe penalties if they don't. Now, some may say that this is uh, anti, like that this that this is goes against the spirit of a free market economy. Um, but for me, I look at this as actually being in the spirit of a free market economy. Because the thing which we want most of all is actually competition. And something which I often say to everyone uh, I, I work with and I've been saying all my life is that competition is a good thing. We need competition. The fact that innovation only arises because of competition. If you look at why some of the greatest advancements in technology have come out of the United States is because they foster so much competition in that they are a free market capitalist society. They do encourage their citizens and their businesses to compete. Now, there are a time when some of those businesses do get too big, such as the likes of a Google or a Meta, where they do get to a point where they're so big that they need to, that they end up doing anti-competitive things, such as lobbying, for instance. But we're not going to go down there. Because at its heart, though, competition means that people need to do better. If you look in the space of Amazon, for instance, and while Amazon, yes, they've also been called out for anti-competitive behavior, what they are doing in terms of logistics, focusing on customer happiness and, and making sure customers are getting their goods fast, are getting their goods cheap, um, are getting their goods, um, you know, uh, being able to return them and, and, and just providing this great overall experience means that they set the standard for where the rest of the industry needs to be. If it wasn't for Amazon, we wouldn't have innovations like a loop returns. We wouldn't be looking at Uber Direct to be able to get something delivered via Uber in one hour. Those things only come about because of competition. Because one player was able to do something which has forced the rest of the market to try to catch up to that. So these are things we often need to look at in terms of competition and why competition can be such a good thing and can be such a good driving force within your business is that while you shouldn't follow the competitor, you should be using that. You should be still being aware of what they're doing in order to innovate, in order to do things better. What you don't want to do is just to copy them and just to do things only because they did it. Now, many places I've worked at before, the fastest way to get something done is to say that your main competitor has also done that. Which means that generally it's a quick way to get the CEO to sign off on it because they're like, well, I want to be that business, so I'm going to do that. So yes, I'm going to sign off on that expense. You can go implement that platform because XYZ brand also did that. But that's not the way to go. The way you should be looking at is how do we keep improving? What are those things? What are those areas they're doing really well in? How do we do better? How do we provide an even better experience? One of the challenges we do have in retail is that there is a lack of innovation currently. That not too many people are willing to take that big, bold bet 
in terms of what they need to do to move the business forward. And while 98% of CEOs are saying they want to innovate, they want to do things differently, sometimes it's just tinkering around the edges. Changing your logo, changing your color palette is not innovating. That's just tinkering. You need to take a real deep, hard look at your business and really focus on where can you get a competitive advantage? Where can you do something in your business which is really going to move the needle? which isn't just going to be tinkering around the edges, but can actually catapult your business into the future. That's making sure you do a thorough review and looking at all the data points, looking at all the key metrics within your business, and also understanding who your customers are and where that aligns with your product set to figure out where that overlap is, where the magic is on that Venn diagram where you can really focus your time and attention. And it isn't going to be by copying your closest competitor. It's going to be by forging your own path forward. So where does this land in terms of groceries? I feel that a move like this with a grocery code of conduct can only be a good thing for the consumer because it is going to hopefully be able to foster more competition in the business, which means that smaller players like an IGA can continue to grow and innovate and that not all the market share is going to go to the, the two incumbents by default just because they're the biggest and the cheapest but because it's going to be a fair playing field or at least a fairer playing field. So look at those ways in which you can level the playing field in your business and make sure that you keep innovating as well. All right, that's all we got time for this week on This Week in E-Commerce. We'll be back next week uh, with our Retail Fest episode. We're going to be recording it on Friday, which means it will be dropping while we are at Retail Fest. Um, So we may even delay that one, actually. Uh, actually, We'll see how we go. We'll see how we go, but we'll definitely be recording something on the Gold Coast, live from the GC, maybe even at the Ecom Nation booth. So like I said before, if you are going to be on the Gold Coast for Retail Fest, please, please, please come up and see the team. There's going to be a few of us around. Look for us in the Ecom Nation Nation t-shirts. Otherwise, our booth is going to be near the Clavio booth, right in the middle of the Expo Hall. So I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Otherwise, keep listening and leave any feedback and comments. We'd love to hear what you guys want to know about next.